tonight. Putin's Holy Alliance, a museum for racist artifacts, and... What the fuck is this? DeAndre Harris, a black man who was beaten and badly hurt during the white nationalist rally in Charlottesville last August, has been found not guilty of assault. Prosecutors claim that before he was beaten, Harris hit a white nationalist on the back of the head. But today, a judge determined that Harris hadn't intended to harm the man. Four men accused of attacking Harris have each been charged with malicious wounding, and three of them have pleaded not guilty so far. President Trump succeeded in heading off some intra-party drama today when he publicly called on a Republican challenger to drop out of the Nevada Senate race. Danny Tarkanian, the son of legendary basketball coach Jerry Tarkanian, had been set to challenge incumbent Dean Heller. Heller is the Republican senator most in danger of losing his seat in the general election, and a primary against Tarkanian would have weakened him even more. Earlier this week, Tarkanian told a local paper there was zero chance he'd reconsider. But after Trump's tweet today, Tarkanian's wife confirmed that he would, in fact, pull out and run for Congress instead. New York Congresswoman Louise Slaughter died today at 88. Slaughter was serving her 16th term in Congress. A microbiologist by training, she was the first woman to chair the powerful House Rules Committee and was a co-author of the Violence Against Women Act. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi said she was heartbroken and called Slaughter a trailblazer. The Capitol's flags will fly at half-staff in her honor. South African prosecutors have renewed corruption charges against former President Jacob Zuma, who was forced to step down last month. The allegations against him include money laundering and fraud stemming from a multi-billion dollar arms deal in the late 1990s, when Zuma was deputy president. The country's national prosecuting authority dropped the initial charges in 2009, but a ruling by the Supreme Court of Appeal last fall deemed that decision irrational paving the way for the case to be reopened. Zuma has maintained his innocence. $3.4 billion worth of annual trade could be at risk if President Trump doesn't exempt the European Union from his tariffs on steel and aluminum. The EU put out a 10-page list of American products that could face tariffs in retaliation. The list includes whiskey, kitchenware, and clothing, among others. Last week, Trump temporarily exempted Canada and Mexico from the tariffs and said that other countries could be spared as well, if they can convince the administration that their exports don't threaten American industry. The tariffs on the unlucky are set to go into effect next week. On Sunday, Vladimir Putin will cruise to another landslide win as Russia's president. It's true that he's banned all meaningful opposition, but it's also true that his popularity is incredibly high, and he's enlisted a powerful partner to make sure it stays that way, the Russian Orthodox Church. This is the regular Sunday service for the congregation of Theodore the Studite. The Sevilad chaplain has been leading worship here for the last two years. Before that, he was the official spokesman for the Russian Orthodox Church. Is what happened to this church fairly typical of what happened to churches during Absolutely. the Soviet time? Uh, most of the churches here in the center of Moscow in all of Russia were lost in the 1920s and 1930s. How long did it take to reconstruct this? About 15 years. Yeah. Almost from nothing. Like most churches in Moscow, Chaplin's was largely destroyed under communism. After the revolution of 1917, the Soviets moved to stamp out organized faith. They stripped religion from education, arrested clergymen, and ordered the destruction of many of Russia's grand cathedrals, including this one, Christ the Savior, which was blown up to make room for a public swimming pool. Chaplin's a polarizing hardliner. He lost his job in part because he openly criticized Kremlin officials over what he saw as their lack of piety. 
But when he was in office, he participated in the church's latest transformation, a close alliance with Vladimir Putin. We were very much oppressed during the Soviet rule. Now the church is free, and uh, what is even more important, we do have an opportunity nowadays to uh, uh, try to influence uh, different spheres of the life of the society. Is Vladimir Putin good for the church here? I don't think he is the best possible choice, but uh, he is the best of, of the options we had uh, since 1917. In Moscow today, the church seems to be everywhere. Under Putin, huge swaths of land have been transferred back to religious ownership, and thousands of new churches have been built or restored at a rate of almost three a day by church figures. More than 70% of Russians identify as Russian Orthodox, up from 30% at the end of the Soviet Union. And the church's conservative social values are now becoming law as the government clamps down on free expression, gay rights, and competing religious sects. There is a kind of an agreement between uh, Putin's administration and, uh, and, uh, and the patriarchy. Boris Falikov, a professor at the Center for Religious Studies at the Russian State University, says this transformation is more than just a religious awakening. What is Putin trying to gain and get out of the church relationship? Church is still popular among uh, the majority of Russian people, and uh, it makes him legitimate, you know, in their eyes. He's supported by the church, it's good. At a certain time, he mm, decided to turn to the right. It was his famous speech in Munich when he said that we are surrounded by enemies, we are betrayed by the Western countries. And it was the beginning of the ideology of, uh, of, uh, of the fortress. And that's how the ideology of traditional values came to the surface. The alliance has proven mutually beneficial for Putin and the church, but it's also created new strains. Victoria Miranova was raised Russian Orthodox, but she rarely attended church. Then, in 2015, church came to her. The government designated the small park outside her home as the site of a future chapel, part of a project to construct 200 Orthodox churches across Moscow. Miranova began a weekly vigil to protest the parish, which still happens every Sunday. This all started because the government gave this land to the church. So who's really the responsible party? Is it the government or is it the church? Я могу думать только о том, что это специальная вот эта провокация со стороны лиц, которые прикрываются православной верой, а на самом деле занимаются, в общем-то, фактическим захватом. What do you think that Putin wants from the church? Власти, конечно. The very idea of separation of church and state is alien to the Orthodox civilization. It's a peculiarity of the West. There's another interpretation, a more that there's a more cynical calculation on on Putin's part that he sees in the church a vehicle to consolidate and expand power in the way he would like to. Well, it's an explanation, uh, a very simplified explanation, which we uh, often hear and see in the West. You don't buy it. I think Putin needed to adapt to uh, his own people. Lenin, Khrushchev, Gorbachev didn't listen to the people and failed. And Putin? We'll see. <laughs> the diplomatic row over the poisoning of a Russian ex-spy kept heating up today, as Britain's foreign secretary, Boris Johnson, pointed the finger right at Putin. We think it overwhelmingly likely that it was his decision to direct the use of a nerve agent on the streets of 
of the UK on the streets of Europe for the first time since the Second World War. That is, that is why we are at odds with Russia. The British government concluded Sergei Skripal and his daughter, who were both still hospitalized, were exposed to Novichok, a toxin developed by the Soviet Union. One of the scientists who helped create Novichok later became a whistleblower and fled to the U.S. in 1992. He's been campaigning to get the chemical agent banned internationally ever since. Меня зовут доктор Билл Мирзаянов. Я участвовал на всех испытаниях нового отравляющего вещества под названием новичок, который 10 раз по меньшей мере сильнее, чем известные все отравляющие вещества в мире, поражает центральную нервную систему, отключает дыхание человека. Сначала начинается миоз, то есть сужение зрачков которые, значит, приводит к тому, что свет не проникает э, глаз человека и э, рвота и непрерывные конвульсии не останавливаемые ни с чем. Наука для меня была такой большой загадкой, которой бы я мог бы попробовать себя, поскольку я в школе учился отлично, имел право поступить в любой колледж, однако В один прекрасный день, в марта 1953 года, меня вызвали КГБ. Я проработал Гаснехт, который разрабатывает эти новые отравляющие вещества 26 лет. Когда я услышал, что был использован для атаки на скрипача и его дочери новичок, я был шокирован. Агент новичок был разработан только в России. Поэтому большой вероятности мы уверены, что за этим стоит только Россия. И я сразу почувствовал, что тут есть и моя доля в этом преступлении. Я полагаю, что это была открытая демонстрация, как э, может, какая судьба может ожидать потенциального оппонента Кремля на примере того, что, может быть, какой-то агент сбежал на Запад с документами об обязательстве сотрудничать с КГБ, например, Трамп. И теперь Путин решил его предупредить. Со временем каждый ученый, конечно, задается вопросом, для чего он вообще-то работает, когда пришел Заключение, что химическое оружие – это оружие массового уничтожения незащищенных людей, это меня подтачивало все время эта мысль, что я участвую в преступном бизнесе. Earlier this week, the New Jersey government announced that it had settled environmental cases involving three oil companies. More than 10 years ago, the state filed suit against Sunoco, Shell, BP, and dozens of other entities over water contamination related to a gasoline additive called MTBE. Combined, the three companies agreed to pay nearly $200 million to the state. And for the first time in a long time, New Jerseyans can be sure that the money will actually be used for restoration. The reason we know for sure that the money from this week's settlements will be used to help the environment is because of former Governor Chris Christie. But it's not because he was an environmental champion. Quite the opposite. On more than one occasion during his second term, Christie diverted money from environmental settlements and used it to fill budget gaps. The end result is that the then governor diverted around $300 million obtained from Passaic River polluters to the state's general fund. Year over year in state budget, Chris Christie would include or line item veto the wishes of legislators and he would divert millions of dollars from environmental restoration protection and putting it into the general fund. So that wasn't great. But it took one particular case to get people really riled up, the ExxonMobil case. 
In 2004, the state filed a complaint against Exxon for environmental damages to creeks and wetlands that the state says it caused around two refineries. But despite arguing in court that Exxon had caused $8.9 billion in damages, Governor Christie ended up settling with Exxon for just $225 million. Here's Brad Campbell, the former commissioner of environmental protection who authorized a complaint against Exxon in 2004. The $8.9 billion figure of damages to natural resources and to the public in this case was presented in court by Chris Christie's own state justice department. At a moment when New Jersey was poised to recover that money, the governor prompted a sweetheart settlement for essentially three cents on the dollar, shortchanging the public and shortchanging the environment. To prevent Christie from diverting around $175 million from that settlement towards the state's general fund, a Democratic state senator introduced a referendum that made it onto the November ballot. The environmentalists wanted to establish a lockbox to ensure that that money would go to the purposes of the original lawsuit. The ballot question passed. On Wednesday, a former state senator filed an appeal with the New Jersey Supreme Court to overturn what he called Christie's giveaway settlement to ExxonMobil. Courts in New Jersey don't often overturn settlements, but it does provide some hope for people who are still mad about the deal. And in the meantime, New Jersey is getting somewhat of a redo. Even though it settled with those three oil companies, it's still actively negotiating with Exxon, this time over the MTBE case, because it too was allegedly involved in the contamination of New Jersey's waters. Governor Chris Christie did not respond to a request for comment. I started collecting racist objects when I was a teenager, and the stuff was everywhere. At a certain point, I ended up with thousands of pieces. I didn't know what I would do with it. I just thought a lot about what it meant to be a person of color living during Jim Crow. I had no intention of creating a museum, but the collection kept growing. So in the 1990s, I gave my collection to the university. It took 15 years. But in 2012, we opened this museum. I have lots of respect for museums that celebrate African-American history, that celebrate African-American accomplishment, but that's not what this facility was. I wanted to, to create an actual racism facility to have people focused on this specific topic in terms of our history. So if you just have a society with millions of just postcards like this, does that reinforce certain ideas about black people and white people. Some of the best discussions we have in the museum are about the word nigga, which sounds kind of weird, by the way, because I'm a sociologist and we don't believe words have any inherent meaning. They're just sound signs that we give. But we do believe that people, once the meanings are given, that they are shared. I mean, no piece is inherently racist. It's a racist society which will create racist objects and will racialize other objects. That's why the watermelon is, is, has a racial, there's nothing inherent about a watermelon that makes us racist, but you know darn well that it's been racialized. Someone looking at uh, Aunt Chimama objects or other mammy images, they don't think of that as offensive. They think of good times spent with their families. It's very nostalgic. Someone else looking at those same pieces, they see the vestiges of slavery and segregation. So often we're not deciding that something is racist, but what we are doing are collecting pieces that help us talk about racism. We have lots of friends of the museum and we receive hundreds of pieces a year. The first director of the museum he said to me one day, hey, there's, there's a couple guys I want you to meet. Here we go. Here's some Jim Crow related materials. These are the dolls and some of them are older, some are newer. These are like 1950s. This is Male cute. and female. Yeah, those, those are really interesting. They are. Our group of friends, friends were all collecting this because we realized what it said about our society and what it said about where we were in the past and where maybe we still were. When we met David Pilgrim and the, the whole Jim Crow Museum and all of that, it was like, 
uh, finally, there's a place where we can put this. A sense work. of relief that we could let go yeah, of these yeah. objects so other people could learn from it. We have some understanding of, of bigotry. We have some understanding of uh, being the outsider or not being accepted or being told that we are not welcomed, we can't be accepted, you, you have no place here. I think because we've experienced that in our own lives, because we're gay, uh, there's a little transference there to trying to help understand the even bigger question of bigotry and then likewise racism. Wow, this is really racist. This is an ashtray where the black washerwoman, she has her one breast stuck in the ringer and so she's hollering. My Whoa. God, that's also sexist. I think the Jim Crow would love this that. This is the Jim Crow. This is on multiple levels. This that. is a wonderful piece. Once we finally discovered the Jim Crow Museum, uh, it gave us more impetus to go out and find, collect, save. They now have at least 500 things from us. By collecting those things, we get a, a broader picture of how racism continued all the way up into the 60s and 70s and still continues. I've seen things right. about President Obama that were horrible. Uh, I think people who go to the Jim Crow Museum are often surprised when they see something from 2015 as racist as many of the things from 100 years ago. And we've had friends who are a complete mess after they've left because suddenly they've been confronted with the truth. For many years when I traveled, I would say that the United States, despite this history of enslavement and Jim Crow, that we are today more democratic and more egalitarian than we've ever been. And I stopped saying that about two years ago. I'm not suggesting that we are back in the Jim Crow period. Don't get it twisted, it's not like that. But what I am saying is I hear and see a level of racist rhetoric that is reminiscent of when I was growing up in Alabama under Governor George Wallace. People say they don't want to talk about race, but they're doing it all the time. But they're not talking about it in places where their ideas can be challenged. Books are filled with facts, and the internet is filled with trash. I'm here to set the record straight on Vicepedia. Which other events is Adam Rippon meddling in? Maternal affirmation, 8%. On some level, I know that I would be like a really good mother and father. Cross-country pence negging. This is a huge part of the pie. Just thinking about MP makes me want to have diarrhea on this entire fucking room. 33%. This is my favorite thing that I've seen. When you have the Oscars at four and a grinder date at five. Yeah, I've dated on the internet. Grinder's just trash. You're not looking for love. You're looking for a mistake. I do the typical upper lip to navel sort of middle ground experience. I'm gonna show you a visual. It's sort of like this. <gasps> I'm flexing. Get some lips in there too, like this, like. <laughs> and then I usually give like an alias. Tinder, it's my own name. The classy version of gay online dating. This is when I went to the store and I stole. Before I go to jail, I'd like to go and train a bit. It's my arch nemesis and Tinder match, Yevgeny Plashenko. He's like banishing me from the rink. I've invented a new jump called the Rippon. I think you can pretty much tell by this eyebrow lift that I ain't taking no shit. So typical me. To be continued. After that, we fucked. Six out of 10. Uh, 
<laughs> Ravishing ass. Wow. That was a close up. I've always had a big muscular glute. This is 1000% a real butt. I don't have a, a lot in my life. So I beg you, don't take away the little joy I get from looking at my own butt. Pull. Oh. I'm sorry, I couldn't, I had to. That's Vice News Tonight for Friday, March 16th. Welcome back to the Cuddler Report, where we believe free market capitalism is still the best path to prosperity. Tax rates are going up in 2011. That's bad. You're taxing banks and well, you're taxing Larry. corporations. You can't tell me this is good. Across the board tax rate cutting and across the board tax cut. Why not across the board tax cuts for everyone? Lower tax rates so people could have their own money. It's our money. Maybe we should get it back. The top tax rate could get to 77%. Could go to 85 or 90%. I can't think of anything dumber, Quint. Steve. Wouldn't it be kind of cool to try something else like lowering tax rates on a permanent basis? Just for the heck of it, Steve. 